welcome to DePaul University. Thank you for taking time out of your evening to join us this evening. I'm confident that you'll find the time well spent. My name is Michael Buddy. I'm a professor of Catholic Studies and Political Science here at DePaul University. I am also a senior research scholar in the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology, which is a research institute sponsored by the university that, uh, that explores the many issues and developments and, and circumstances affecting the church in the majority world, the so-called Global South of Asia, Africa, Latin America, elsewhere. Uh, this evening is one of the events in our series on the works of mercy, a theme that we've been exploring with an eye toward different uh, expressions of traditional Christian practice as lived out and exemplified in, in the varied times, places, and circumstances of the contemporary world. Uh, this evening, as part of that series, I'm pleased to present to you Professor Gerald, Geraldina Cespedes. Uh, Professor Cespedes is a sister of the Dominican Missionaries of the Holy Rosary, part of the Dominican sisters family worldwide. Um, many people in our line of work aspire to be both scholars and, and activists, people who have a foot in the academy as well as in the everyday life of, of communities, struggles and opportunities that present themselves. Sister Geraldina does that in a way that uh, is inspirational to many of us. She's a, uh, she's, a, she's a theologian with a doctorate in theology uh, from Spain. She teaches at multiple universities across Latin America. She's on the board of one of the most important international theological associations in the world, the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians. Uh, the bio that, she, that is on the sheet for you is is both thorough and excessively modest. I will spare you having to read it to you, but I, I can commend her to you with considerable enthusiasm, and she is here with our great appreciation. Um, our plan for this evening is to uh, hear from Sister Geraldina on the topic of religion in Latin America, things that all, all that is solid melts into air, as someone once said. Change and continuity play themselves out in a variety of different and sometimes unexpected measures. Uh, you have an obligation or two on you this evening as a quality audience. We, we welcome your questions after her comments, and you have a lot of food to eat over on the side table. So please feel free throughout the evening to quietly and discreetly rise from your seat and, and, and help deal with the, 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 the bounty that's been laid before us, courtesy of the university. So it does give me great pleasure to welcome Sister Helena and present her to you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Everybody, and thank you very much for being here in this cold spring <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> I hope uh, the themes that we are uh, knowing and approaching this afternoon will help us to put some warm on my, in our hearts and in our minds. I want to thank. Uh, people from the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology for inviting me, and especially uh, those who are here this afternoon, Karen, for your work preparing my coming here, or the good communication. I would like to indicate uh, briefly what is the context from where I'm talking about the theme of the, as you can see, uh, uh, there, the challenge of the changing religious imagination in Latin America, and how this topic interests me very much, not only by professional deformation as a theologian, 
but as an everyday and vital matter, since I'm living in a country, Guatemala, where many of the things that I'm going to say this afternoon, and this evening, are, we can verify uh, many of the statements that I will do at this conference. I point out just uh, two elements from the context of the neighborhood where I lived and also some elements from the continent uh, in this uh, matter of uh, uh, religious uh, changes. But they are also happening around the world. That is a, a, a topic that is not just for Latin America. Two things that are very important because always I I'd like to uh, start from the context. When you understand the context, you uh, are able to discover the meaning of the text and the things that we are going to say. So, from Guatemala reality, I want to show you this picture because it's the neighborhood from uh, where I'm doing theology. From that situation is from where I'm thinking, uh, looking for some reason of hope for the people and from my pupils. I'm not just uh, in the university, but half of my time is living in this in this place that is one of the area of Guatemala a most uh, intercultural and pluri-religious. They in that place there are living people from uh, the 23 ethnic group of Guatemala, in addition of some foreigners who have migrated. Uh, elsewhere from Central America, from Honduras, Salvador, Nicaragua, from different countries. It is uh, a neighborhood composed based uh, primarily by people that they were displaced during the time of the war, so they arrived uh, to this uh, part of the city. Another group is, are the victims of the earthquake and some of them <coughs> are uh, the uh, the survival of the hurricane Mitch. It is one of the area most affected by poverty and violence and at the same time which has more Catholic and evangelical churches than any other area. Around my house, and very near, you can count ten churches. And at night sometimes I have to do that. <laughs> because all of them, they want to sing, they want to preach. So, uh, why I'm putting this picture? Uh, because when we are studying uh, and we check and we read the uh, affirmation of other theologians like Paul Nietzsche, he says that one of the characteristics of the third world countries is the existence or coexistence of two situations and that uh, can, we can see in this phrase many poor people and many religions and I can verify that in that neighborhood where I live in and the second uh, affirmation is that in the current political situation in Guatemala there is a manipulation of the religious discourse for everything. This is happening in most of the country of Latin America, but as I'm coming from Guatemala, and in this moment, we are just uh, two months from general election for presidential, presidency, Congress of the Republic. And so I'm very sensitive with that problem of the use or utilization of the religion for a political purpose. It is calls my attention how the use of the name of God and religious symbols are now in fashion, not only in Guatemala, but in other places also. 
uh, in this moment, uh, we have a very distasteful government which has led the country to a setback in economic terms, human rights, and fight against impunity and corruption. And all of that is done in the name of God. Using the name of God for everyone. On all sides, there is an inflation of religious language. And here is the interest right now in the believer's vote. So this is uh, just the two things that I wanted to point out uh, before uh, starting the, this topic. And the topic of the challenges of the changing religious imagination in Latin America, I want to, <coughs> to start, um, sorry, I will read uh, my uh, discourse because uh, my English is a little rusty, <laughs> many years without speaking English. So since the last decades, Latin America, the so-called Christian continent, has undergone a series of changes and mutations in its religious landscape. We are now experiencing times of severe shaking and socio-religious affecting people's lives and the ways in which belief, believing communities interpret, practice and organize their belief systems. To address the issue of changes in Latin American religious imagination, I will make a presentation in four parts. I invite you to, to follow and to think about these uh, four things that I want to focus on. The first is an approach to the current religious situation in Latin America, which goes from the spiritual uh, spiritual affair sense the, the marks the all the world panorama to the growth of some forms of atheism and also agnosticism. Second, I would like to explore some phenomena that in religious map of Latin America. Third, some factors influencing religious transformation. And finally, um, to, know, uh, to see some challenges and tasks that the Catholic Church has in the face of these religious changes. Um, first part. Um, here, uh, I want to say that many of the analyses that uh, are made about the changes in the religious landscape of Latin America focused uh, on only the two aspects that they consider more striking. The loss of monopoly by Catholic Church and the growth of the evangelical churches and new religious movement, especially Pentecostalism and new, new Pentecostalism. But although it is true that they are uh, in Latin America has been uh, uh, given this uh, phenomenon, this Catholicization and the exodus of the Catholic to the evangelical churches and the mass, uh, massive Pentecostalization, of Christianity, but uh, it is not only in the evangelical and Protestant group, but also in a, a Catholic with the charismatic charismatism. Um, but we cannot forget that together with this uh, two striking phenomena, other realities and other expressions of the religion are emerging, and question and challenge certain theological and pastoral approaches of the church. I would like to see some of them. This is the first uh, I want to, to talk about, the spiritual sphere uh, sense and the return to the sacred. In Latin America, we live in a paradox because uh, on one hand, we can talk about abandonment of traditional beliefs and a decline of participation in religious institutions, but on the other hand, we are witnessing an unprecedented spiritual effervescence that it is against the uh, philosophers and sociologists of religion had predicted. In spite of the profound changes and strong shakes that in these last decades have been given, 
the threat of the religions has not been broken, nor uh, it has been able to be cut, but then what is happening indeed is that people are discovering a plurality of threads and ways of waving them and combining them. That is a metaphor to understand what is happening in this moment. These are times of full manifestation of pluralism in which the what is, has not changed, what you believe, but rather is the how what is changing. In other words, the way of believing and expressing the relationship with the sacred and with the religious institution. Latin America is one of the places where we can discover that uh, the effervescence of the sacred, we live in a re-enchantment of the world and a fascination for the religious. But at the same time, there is a deep crisis and a weakening of religious institution. One of the issues discussed today is that in Latin America, and at the same time in another part of the world, there is a growing interest in spirituality and a growing abandonment of religious institutions. These are times when there is a change in the religious councils and a reconfiguration of Christianity. In all areas of life, uh, show great interest in the religious, but they understand that the spiritual life is a personal matter that can be lived in a subjective uh, way without being tied or committed to a certain religious structure. The number of people looking for spirituality is growing, but they want to feel um, free and uh, without institutional coercion of any kind. It is a kind of religiosity a la carte in which each person elaborates his own menu, taking and mixing with, without any problem different ingredients from different religions. Um, here uh, we can see one of those changes in this map, in the decade of the 60s, uh, in Latin America, we were 90% of the population were Catholic. But now, in this present decade, it is 60, 69% of the, all the population of Latin America. We can say that the percentage of believers in America has not changed so much in recent decades with the exception of one of the most secularized countries of the continent, that is Uruguay, followed by Chile and Argentina, where um, this uh, has been very more uh, noticeable. The statistics show that in the continent, more people are still recognized as believers. Uh, these are from uh, 2014, uh, the detail for in every country, but um, a survey of 2011 indicated that 84% confessed a religion, 4% confessed themselves a atheist, 2% agnostic in the continent, and this is important 10% without belonging to any religion. However, this 10% does not correspond to non-religious people, but rather they could be people without institutional belonging or who live their religiosity in a free way, not going to any religious institution, but they are believers. After Africa, Middle East, Latin America remains it remains one of the most religious regions of the world where the uh, revitalization of ancestral traditions and the common spiritual awakening come together. We, we, in this time we can say that 
the spirituality is in fashion. Religious institutions are declining. So this is, we, we can see that it's quite uh, challenging uh, for uh, Catholic Church and for all the institutions. Uh, I want to refer to the rise of Pentecostalism and New Pentecostalism. This is uh, one of the most uh, outstanding religious phenomena in Latin America uh, that began in the 70s, in the decades of the 70s, and from there it spread to all the countries and another continent. Uh, but Central America is the area where there is a more uh, significant growth. This rapid expansion responds to a well-articulated plan from the sphere of the local and also North American power to counteract the advance of social movements, social organization, and the uh, based Christian communities and other groups committing to the cause of liberation that uh, were seen as a, a danger or a, it was a, a plan. And also many uh, governments from uh, Latin America, and concretely from Guatemala, they decided that uh, uh, people in uh, based ecclesial community and they are very committed with the past social pastoral, they, they have to stop them. And for that reason is why uh, Guatemala has, a, a, we say that we are now, uh, in, in this time, bearing, bearing people that we have found in the, in the film and uh, uh, the martyrs, the martyrs, many of them, they were killed because they were, they understood that the Christian faith uh, implied that uh, uh, being committed with the cause of the poor and the cause of justice and, and peace. And uh, it was when I, I was born in Dominican Republic, but when I arrived to, as a missionary to Guatemala, I remember that some terms you, you couldn't use there and even the Latin American Bible, the Red Bible, you couldn't use it. And many people, they had to bury the Bible and uh, they protected it in plastic bag. And now they are uh, taking it out uh, because it was uh, dangerous. Today, um, Pentecostalism is the most growing and expanding religious movement reaching 20% of the Christian population of Latin America. But in the case of the region where I live, Central America, this percentage is double and in countries like in Guatemala, followed by Honduras and Nicaragua, Pentecostals represent 40% of the population. That's very high. This is uh, for that reason, uh, now uh, uh, scholars are interested in going to Guatemala to explore what is happening with the Pentecostalization. But uh, this is 40% is the people that they confess that they attend to, a, they, they are affiliated to a Pentecostal church. But there is another phenomenon, uh, I will talk a little bit later, that is the Pentecostalization of the daily life. Even if you are not a Pentecostal, but it does influencing in children through the mass media, and uh, this is a phenomenon very important. The rise of Pentecostalism is linked, on the one hand, to sociocultural factors, and on the other hand, to religious factors. On a sociocultural and political level, uh, the growth of Pentecostalism has to do with the sociopolitical and economic crisis that our people are living, plunged into precariousness and insecurity, also the moral collapse and political disenchantment that leads people to trust in a spiritual salvation and not in any uh, leader. Also, the process of urbanization, Pentecostalism is an urban uh, phenomenon, although at this moment it is also spreading in the 
uh, in villages in the countryside. The deterioration of the social fabric, the anomie and the rupture of the human relations and the precariousness of the basic services, especially health care, because many people, very poor people from the, the first picture I was showing you, they say, uh, why are you going to that uh, Pentecostal church? And they said, because I'm very sick and I have no money and the government is not helping me for any so solution, going to a Pentecostal church. This is a, in, in a, a socio-cultural <coughs> level. At the religious level, one one factor leading to people to Pentecostalism are in the, the rigidity and dogmatism in certain traditional churches and um, they are often disconnected uh, speeches and sometimes very boring sermon of the uh, not connected with life. Why uh, people, uh, when you ask, they say, oh, in Pentecostal churches, uh, liturgies uh, have, are very uh, lively and, and festive, and uh, they in incorporate um, bodily expressions, movement, emotion, and chants, etc. Also, another factor is the clericalism and ecclesial centralization that empowers a little the laity. The demands from, uh, for affective and effective closeness in a specific situation, for instance, in case of the disaster, disaster natural disaster, or when the uh, family is uh, going through tragic or uh, situation or suffering and so on. Also, the bureaucracy and the many requirements of the church, uh, for instance, for sacraments, uh, so people say, while the Pentecostals, they tend to have a simpler and freer organization. One lady was telling me, well, I've been in Catholic church and I have never been preaching in front of all the people, just the priest and the people who are connected very closely to the priest, but now, uh, just in two months, I'm taking the microphone and I'm preaching. I'm somebody I have been taking into account. <coughs> There's another phenomenon. So, uh, important uh, phenomenon in Latin America is the return to the ancestral religions. They have passed from the secrecy, clandestinity, to visibility. This is the picture of a, um, a Mayan, from, from Mayan religion. They are, all of them, they are young, but they are uh, priests. They are a young a spiritual guides. Uh, we, we call in the language of Guatemala, aquí, aquí, like uh, spiritual guides. And they are, um, um, in a serialized in a Mayan uh, ceremony that uh, is in the natural space. The presence of Christianity and the conversion of indigenous and also black uh, people did not mean, in most of the cases in Latin America, an abandonment of the indigenous religions, but rather a reinterpretation of the Christian elements from the parameters of the religious traditional. Thus, many of the Christian saints were baptized, sites, uh, another name, they were given another name, or were in interpreted by the indigenous and uh, African Americans, resembling them to what they knew in their uh, native religions. Since the time of colonization, as it was compulsory, uh, Obligatory to participate in Catholic rites, a secret religion was produced that combines the Christian beliefs with the African and indigenous uh, principles. The indigenous and African American religions were considered by the Portuguese and Spaniards as superstitious, uh, superstitious practices 
uh, diabolical or like witchcraft. So their followers uh, had to find mechanism to keep them alive, practically in secrecy. <coughs> centuries, uh, many, many years in that uh, situation. Um, I remember that in Dominican Republic and also in Cuba, you can see, and Haiti, uh, that uh, people have the uh, small old altar in the houses and all the Catholic saints, they are visible and they put very high all the Catholic and the Virgin Mary, all the saints are there and well decorate the altar and uh, on the table, water, flowers, and the rosary, all the things. But the table, the table has a cloth, and when you go behind, hidden there are all the other goddess from Africa and from the uh, Maya indigenous religion, but if some missionary priests or nuns arrive to houses, they say, oh, we are very Catholic, but indeed they are practicing two religions, without any problem, but because of the accusation that it is witchcraft and a superstition, they uh, have to, 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 hit, uh, to hide uh, this, uh, the, another uh, goddess. That's very curious because when uh, you, you uh, as a missionary, you get in touch and confidence with the family, and they say, well, you are like part of my family. Look at this part of my altar, and you can know the other uh, divinities, uh, you know. Many of the popular religions have been seen as mar marginal religions practiced by subaltern classes. Despite the processes of demonization and sometimes persecution of these religions, they have survived and although they have been not in practice in a public and open place for long years, in privacy, in the homes, in the houses, and also in the inner interior life of the people, they are alive, they are still alive. They are really used that they don't need temple. That is very important. Like uh, indigenous people, they don't need temple. Uh, there are some pyramids, but it's not for ceremony. Pyramids, it was just for keeping the secret, the sacred objects and or the houses for the um, the priests, the old uh, priests. But indeed, the the place where God, where the divinity. Uh, inhabit uh, uh, is the is nature also in African uh, spirituality so um, today the phenomenon the what is the the uh, newness that many people today they confess they me their membership to these religions as an, a kind of affirmation of their identity there is now this important thing that is a recovery of the ancestral religions, the ritual, ceremonies, and um, they, they come out today in the public light and also recover that the, the sacred times, the calendar, for instance, in Guatemala, there are several Mayan calendars, uh, very precise, and symbols, ceremonial costumes, Rituals. It is one of the strong demands of the <coughs> indigenous uh, and Afro-descendant peoples. As uh, I remember, when in uh, 19, uh, 1992, when it was the fourth conference of the Silan, uh, the conference of Bishop Latin America in Santo Domingo, and uh, one. Uh, uh, many indigenous were there to talk with the Pope and to ask uh, to the all the bishops to recognize and to value and not to content the uh, native uh, traditional religions. And one Equatorian indigenous, uh, Jose Casimuel, he said to all the bishops this phrase, somebody wants to read that there, 
the only way we ask, the, the only thing we ask our bishops is that they recognize us, the right to be Christian while being indigenous, and open ways to make this conviction concrete. Thank you very much. This is a, a very a clear the, the demand because uh, um, the uh, missionaries, they said you have to renounce to all that is uh, uh, demoniac, that is uh, witchcraft, and it says, how can we be uh, Aymara, Maya, um, uh, Azteca, Kachike, from different ethnic group, and to be also um, a Christian? In the face of the history of denial, demonization, and discrimination against indigenous and African American religions, Today there is a resurgence of the expression, and sometimes uh, also from the churches and um, other time it is out outside of them. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Chiapas. This is an example, indeed. Uh, that is an inspiration. The diocese of San Cristobal de las Casas taking seriously the cosmovision, indigenous cosmovision, and all the rituals. I, I thought, when I didn't know very much about uh, the, the diocese, because I just uh, were just visiting or giving some, some course, some workshop, but now that I'm close, uh, and I can see that it's very strong, and they have found a, a synthesis in Christianism and uh, Maya spirituality. And that sign of hope, it is that uh, young people, young people are uh, rediscovering that, because sometimes we say, well, it is adult or the elderly, but young people, because I, I had a meeting one day of uh, a workshop um, uh, with young people uh, from 15 to 20 and they prepared one hour of prayer and all of that was from the Mayan Cosmovision. It's, it's uh, interesting what is um, happening. So there is a growing public manifestation of the spiritual practices of indigenous people seen uh, by some uh, uh, of the people that uh, uh, indigenous spirituality is a kind of reserve, a spiritual and ethic uh, reserve that can guide us toward uh, a new model of church and also a new model of development with a high sense of respect to, for the nature and the defense of the territory of the peoples that there are issues of great concern and relevance in the midst of the environmental crisis and the depredation of natural resources. Now we are um, uh, uh, very hopeful with this uh, synod of Amazonia uh, that the, uh, uh, Pope Francis has uh, called for that uh, synod. Uh, syn uh, this year, it will be in October, but it's not just the the the, the jungle, the, the country, the the rainforest, uh, Amazonia, but it's the Amazonia and the people, all the indigenous group living there. How we can take them seriously? How they can renew uh, all the organization of the church and the mission of the church? Another known phenomenon is the growth of atheism and agnosticism. This is quite paradoxical, but it's happening, it's happening also. Uh, in general, many believers in Latin America, when talking about atheism or agnosticism, consider that they are fashions in which we have not yet entered, or somebody told me, oh, they are diseases that we have not yet contracted, or perhaps are diseases for which we are already vaccinated <laughs> because we are uh, uh, the uh, Christian continent. 
In general, there has been little interest in, in addressing atheism and agnosticism, as we have seen them as a phenomenon peculiar of the developed countries. And it is true that there are countries, um, the first uh, world in the developed uh, uh, world, where you can talk about that there exists an environmental atheism, a lack of interest in religious as well as in most uh, uh, Latin American countries, we can talk about environmental and cultural Christianity. Um, you know, um, I was uh, here in Latin America. Our problem is uh, there is some hyper-religious uh, language. We are talking about religious in some countries. Uh, and uh, I can see Guatemala. Uh, the, so people are talking about, in a few minutes you are in the bus, and the first question, uh, your religion, your religion, and we are t uh, uh, talking about religion. And uh, when I, I went to, I, I lived uh, in Spain for eight years, I was surprised in the, uh, in the, in the other ground, in the buses, public transport, people are not talking about religion. That is like taboo, a, a, a taboo. They, it's much better they are talking about sex, about another uh, sport or other thing, but no religion. But in Guatemala and in many other countries in Latin America, that is a very important uh, question. Even when a boy and girl are knowing each other and a few minutes they are in conversation and they ask quickly, what's your religion is? <laughs> so this is... So in, in that context, we have to talk about the, the, the topic of atheism and agnosticism that um, has been not a matter for research uh, for uh, finding out. Although after the Second Vatican Council, the Church took uh, the, seriously the, the study of the atheism, even uh, the Vatican created in 1965, the Secretariat for Non-Believers, they had a an, an, uh, publication, Atheism and Dialogue, and so the question of the dialogue between believers and non-believers and the analysis of the phenomenon of atheism was not a, uh, was not a concern from Latin American church, but it was uh, in Europe it was strong or is still strong. Um, even in, in, in Spain, in many countries of Europe, they went farther because they were not talking just about atheism, but the religious indifference. Religious indifference is a phenomenon that goes even beyond, beyond the atheism because it is the most radical form of, of uh, atheism. Because it is not um, atheism, because of denial, but insensibility and comes after atheism. Religious indifference corresponds then to a time that we can call post-atheist or post-religious. Both re with regard to the atheism and agnosticism, um, one has to distinguish two situations. One of them is pre-religious atheism, or agnosticism and another is post religious. In the first, I mean pre religious atheism, are the people who are the atheists uh, because of the little training or lack of knowledge, or they haven't been in touch with that uh, believing um, community. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, in the second group are people who, after being involved in churches and very committed uh, in religious group, and after uh, some uh, knowledge and practice uh, of the structure of religion, 
they come to a level of reflection in which they consider that the most honest is to deny the question of God and leave it in suspense in the case of agnosticism. We tend to consider the agnostic as someone who is not defined, who does not take a position, but in reality the agnostic takes his freedom seriously and sees as an honest and serious possibility of not taking stance which is uh, more uh, more comfortable posture to be atheist or believer or agnostic <laughs> maybe <laughs> uh, maybe maybe uh, that the uh, agnostic uh, according to a uh, Spanish theologian Miret Magdalena he says that the agnostic is a man without theological tragedy since 14, there is only what is in there, what is in front of there. In, in Latin America, atheism and agnosticism have their defined map. Thus, we find that the, the highest the number of atheists and agnostics are found in Uruguay. Uruguay is, is a country that maybe we, we, we have to do some uh, more research there because it's the unique case of a truly secular state in all the continent that uh, it means that they have a very strict separation uh, between religion and state uh, in, in Uruguay we have been there and in the public life you and in, in politics and even in the name of the cities of the country the streets and towns you 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 don't find name of the saints like in Guatemala many uh, countries many uh, villages and uh, towns they have the name of the saints and in Dominican Republic also but in Uruguay you 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 don't find that even there is the prohibition of using religious symbols in public institutions like in the hospital uh, crucifi crucifixes this is, a, in some way, we can say that it's a, something, a positive element since um, being separated from the state, the Catholic Church, as the, some sociologist of religion says, like Nestor da Costa, that's an authority in, in that matter, he says that in that way, the Church has to legitimize its uh, role, not from the power, or from the privilege, but from its participation, the commitment in the civil society. Okay, the five. Uh, here I uh, said the continuity of the old question of idolatry. It's an old question because it was posed by uh, liberation theology uh, when they said uh, traditionally that uh, in Latin America the problem is not atheism neither uh, agnosticism but idolatry and it is with the respect of the question that uh, uh, liberation theology has uh, uh, done a very good contribution and still they are right uh, we are writing about uh, and discussing about the uh, uh, idolatry John Sobrino states that in Latin America, the most radical dialectical pole for theology is not atheism, but idolatry. And that in the Bible, the same Bible shows that the sense of Israel's faith is to present an anti-idolatrous vision of God that has as the central axis the experience of salvation. God is the God who saves, who gives life, why idols cannot save, and instead of salvation, they produce victims, destruction, death. This is uh, connected today that with the problem of the, the uh, market and all the, the, politic, the uh, economic power that is the idolatry of the money or the, the, the power, uh, the economic uh, power. So, uh, Pablo Richard from uh, Costa Rica called it the fetishism of money. 
And um, this is the, the old question of idolatry. I think still needs to be raised today because we are living in a system that there is an exaltation of the economic power and the money. And this requires um, uh, to remember how in the Gospel, in the New Testament, there is the affirmation of incompatibility between God and money. That's in the text of Matthew 6, 24. And also, St. Paul uh, has done invitation. Do not conform or accommodate to this system in the letter to the Romans in the chapter 12. This is another uh, point on how we have to rethink secularization and lay system in uh, Latin America. This is an um, um, important um, um, that in the laicism, uh, I just want to count a, a metaphor to understand uh, how um, religion in that time uh, is not the center of social life. Um, we have to consider that it is have to find, uh, and especially Catholic Church, a more egalitarian space with other dimensions of life. A metaphor used by Jose Maria Mardones to illustrate the situation more religious in a secularized uh, society is the uh, a religious religion ceases to be the necessary ingredient as we have thought in the past. We in the past we are the necessary uh, ingredient in social life, but today, that we say, not the necessary uh, uh, ingredient, but a condiment is different. A condiment that each person chooses freely if that if they decide to put a religious, the, the religious um, taste, uh, the religious taste to life. Um, well. I want just to mention this, um, to, to go to some phenomena on the religious map of Latin America. There are seven phenomena that uh, just summarizing this part that is happening now in, the, in, in America, Latin America. One of them, we can call this the, the inst this institutionalization of the um, religious. Uh, the no necessity of uh, uh, to attend to an uh, um, institution for uh, to express uh, your religiosity. So the phenomenon, this tendency, is that of believing without belonging. The, uh, Peter Berger, Berger uh, called that, or believers without a church that uh, is this phenomenon. Second, the transhumans or religious roaming, roaming, immigrating. You can, that is uh, especially among uh, evangelicals uh, in the Pentecostalism that is very common that you uh, can move freely to immigrate from another religious expression. Uh, that's, uh, uh, religious roaming that is very characteristic in 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 the Pentecostal and the new religion movement having this uh, sense I I think it's a sense of the uh, the the show the great capacity of to adapt to the liquid modernity as Sigmund Bauman used to say because uh, in some places, in some churches, they don't preach that you have to be, to remain forever in that church. But I say just, you have to look for God and to a better life, and, but you don't have to, to stay uh, longer. That is also a problem because uh, it can lead people to move to another church just for convenience or for emotion 
or just uh, or it can be a problem because they do not assume a commitment to the community where they can contribute uh, in a more stable or longer term in a missionary uh, project. Another phenomenon, I like this very much because it's was I telling you with the, the example of the altar, the double altar in the same house, in the same table. That is the double, we call bi pertenencia. We have that word, bi pertenencia, or I think my translation was uh, good, double, uh, double religious uh, uh, belonging. Especially it happens in the, with the indigenous people and African American uh, uh, people that uh, they, they is a kind of, uh, they use as a survival strategy uh, because of the history. Another uh, phenomenon is the Pentecostalization of Christianity and uh, uh, the claim that Latin America was a continent of poor and Catholics can no longer be done, at least in the second part, because there has been a great change in the poor in terms of religious belonging. In one assessment of liberation theology, we observe in Guatemala, but also in other countries, what uh, the theologians, uh, Joseph Kamblan, have already said in Brazil regarding to the commitment of the Catholic Church. And he says, the Catholic Church opted for the poor, but the poor opted for Pentecostalism. <laughs> this is, this, this is, uh, that we can verify in the daily life. So, uh, what is the, what the, the phenomenon? That is not just the growing of uh, Pentecostal churches, but, but the phenomenon of the um, <clears throat> of the Pentecostalization of the daily life. So we are living in a, in an atmosphere in a Pentecostal uh, atmosphere, and especially because of the Pentecostal, they, they have the power now mass media, and so you are using uh, you are sometimes using the language of Pentecostalism. It can be said some countries that uh, in some countries the name of the Pentecostalism in the church is the is the church uh, of the rich neo Pentecostalism because poor people are just Pentecostals but neo Pentecostal are more the rich people in some uh, countries and they we can distinguish them because uh, distinguish. Uh, Pardon, because they make prayers encounters in luxury hotels and preaches the theology of prosperity and performs great economic campaigns to build mega temples. Mega temples on the New Pentecostal, uh, for instance, twice a big temple in Guatemala, there is the Christian Fraternity of Guatemala, the largest religious building in all Central America with the capacity for more than 2,000 people and uh, it is, has cost uh, $30 million and offense in a country where the vast majority of the population lives in humble shops in the countryside or in city, in the city cramped into a precarious houses in the ravines. For its part, uh, there is the pastor Cash Luna, that he built the church, the house of God, the greatest evangelical denomination of Guatemala, and this uh, church has 25 station radio radio stations, and uh, the mega temple. And now this is in problem because uh, the authority in Guatemala they have discovered that this church has uh, has links with the corruption and bribery. Uh, and now the, with people that are in jail, like the former government, and they are connected. If, uh, another, uh, we can ask, is Latin Americans, <clears throat> there is a soft orientalization of the West? It means that influence of Eastern religion, Eastern practices are part of the plurality of religious offering that we can uh, Another offer, so there are everywhere disseminated courses of uh, transcendental meditation, same vipassana, reiki, 
Tai Chi, mindfulness, yoga. So there are, this is a, the orientalization of the Western that is taking place also in Latin America. And here, the quest for more spirituality and less religion. That is, uh, is something uh, that is, is in the moment, that it is a sign of the time, we say. And uh, finally, uh, because of the, um, the quest for spirituality has been commercialized also, and it is a profitable business, it is, it is true, but there are many good things. Um, but uh, in this time, in the middle of that, uh, plurality, religious plurality, uh, some people think that uh, we have to return to Hakif security and to defend our faith and mark the limits and not to tolerate real activism. For that is why in this postmodernity, fundamentalism also springs up in certain groups of Latin America. So this uh, the rebound of fundamentalism that is. Um, is uh, one of the most disturbing religious phenomena of our time, everywhere, and this phenomenon is in all region and all religion. Because sometimes we think that fundamentalism, oh, the Protestant, oh, the Muslims, but sometimes I think that if the test of fundamentalism is passed to us. I don't, I'm not sure if I'm going to approve to to. <laughs> so, in, uh, fundamentalism is now also in, in the moment, uh, but it is not just, is, uh, in the church is becoming a model of government life uh, and social coexisting. So we are living in an atmosphere of fundamentalism and fundamentalism that is very dangerous because uh, fundamentalism is uh, is based on the negation of the subject and the denial of the fat subject occur in multiple ways and connected with the system and uh, in the name of fundamentalism we can uh, negate uh, to forget the 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 right of the new subjects. I want to, to finish here because we have to talk and to discuss and to hear what do you think, but uh, just uh, I passed some, a couple of um, uh, image just to think that these factors that are influenced as is uh, summarizing Factors influencing the transformation of the religious, not to forget the urbanization process, the uh, modern um, uh, information and communication technologies, what is their role in this uh, uh, situation, religious situation, the emergence of the new subjects also, uh, like indigenous women, as descendants, and the claim the, the, of the young people, also to take into account the situation of poly crisis that we are living, how it affects the weakening of testimony of the, this Catholic Church, the lack of ethical, spiritual um, coherence, and uh, finally, the remaining of the legacy of liberation theological tradition. It is not, it has demonstrated that liberation theology is not uh, a, the, the principle of the option for the poor is not a poor option because now there is a diversity of theology and pastoral commitments that in the middle of persecution but is still um, alive so i prefer to now to listen to you and i will finish with just a, a, a one more things uh, like uh, some challenges or maybe you can also talk about uh, challenges for the Catholic Church. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have two requests for you in the time we have remaining. We 
We have approximately 20 minutes. Uh, I would ask that because we are recording the session that you please step to the microphone up front so that we may hear your question. And secondly, so that we will all have a chance to participate, please, please confine yourself to a question, um, preferably a single uh, succinct question. Uh, I, I, would, I would prefer that one not give a, a long discourse ending with the phrase, what do you think of that? Um, that, that, tends to, that tends to inhibit conversation rather than advance it. So uh, the floor is open. Um, sister is yours. Saturday, and you can see in those uh, poor neighborhoods, all the people are going to some religious place. So it's not uh, about the, the, the believers, but the diversity and uh, the, the offers, different uh, uh, offers that there are, and it is, I think, is connected with the. Uh, Poly crisis. There are several crises. The the history of Central America, with so many people has been killed, so many disasters that the volcano, the eruption of the volcano, the hurricane, and the earthquake, and the, the violence and the, the deterioration of the uh, uh, social services, and people are in a situation of. Abandonment, abandonment and uh, suffering. So uh, the religious group they used to visit to 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 approach to people who are in disgrace in in problem. And this is very very easy that when you are suffering and somebody uh, arrives to the place where you are. Uh, I'm so. This, this is one of the situations. Another one is that the history of Central America, especially uh, Guatemala, Honduras, Salvador, uh, was under the influence of uh, evangel um, um, government. Uh, it's not a question of evangelical Protestant, but very uh, ultra conservative, conservative with their mentality, and also from outside. Uh, for instance, from the uh, um, uh, United States, there were people were paid, they received money, to they were financiation to uh, spread the new religious movement in order to uh, stop the church of the poor, uh, the especially based Christian communities, and theology of liberation. Just a strategy. So there are many factors. I, I consider that your, your question is very good because it allows us to, to point out uh, what is the problem. Thank you. Somebody else? First of all, uh, thank you, Sister, for a really wonderful presentation. Uh, in the United States and in Europe, we're seeing a political alignment between the far right 
and trying to bring a, a far right influence into the Catholic Church. Uh, are you seeing similar trends in Central and South America? I'm thinking in Bolsonaro. Uh, it's uh, that's connection, but uh, much better to talk from Guatemala. And the connection is, is now, uh, last year and this year, uh, the this march in the street for uh, they set the, the right uh, to defend the family, uh, national sovereignty, the sovereignty, the topic, uh, and uh, they say our identity, uh, nationalism, that that discourse, and the uh, there is clear, clear connection. Uh, in the hegemonical power, economic and political, with the um, conservative uh, religious, doesn't matter if it's Catholic, Pentecostal, or the Presbyterian, whatever. Uh, one example, we uh, have a picture uh, that there was uh, the movement, there is that movement called is uh, Opus Dei. Opus Dei, they have uh, Pro Vida. There are many from Opus Dei and from uh, Heraldos del Evangelio. It's another group, he, many of them. And uh, they prepared the uh, demonstration. They went on the street. Uh, uh, and they were together, together, in in the same in the same picture in front of the Congress. They were just with the, the same slogan: "We are the defenders of the family." But they are, are just taking one point of the family, and in that demonstration, they were all the the right wings. Uh, uh, and even the genocide, the people accused of genocide in Guatemala. And uh, they were together, they were uh, uh, hand by hand, uh, uh, pastors, uh, priests, uh, thank God any bishop, but because the conference of Bishop of Guatemala is quite uh, committed with the poor and there is a couple, there are a couple, but a couple of them are some, but most of the bishops are very clear uh, in, in how to act in this uh, moment. But they were, all, all of them, uh, and now it's quite complicated, uh, the electoral process, because politicians are using, they want the believers vote and they are using the discourse of uh, moral, but, um, moral sexual uh, question, and they are uh, presenting that they are uh, saving the family, the values of family, so um, as to, that is di diabolic, that the uh, same-sex uh, marriage, uh, abortion, and this kind of topic, they say, uh, manipulation. But there is, in the case of Guatemala and Central America, what is the problem? There are a lot of money. <laughs> That's because they organize a great convention, a great uh, congress, and it is in, in the in, in a an hotel, and they announced that any Christian that wanted to go there, especially they went uh, to to convince a priest, you don't have to pay, and you will be in that luxury hotel, and you don't have to pay anything. 
but there was um, an investigation and uh, uh, money from the sector very involved in corruption and coming from one of the, the bar in Guatemala, 14 families that they have all the best lands, all the, the wealth of the country. Thank you, sister. Um, my question is um, with regard to the origin of these Pentecostal movements. Um, uh, Guatemala has seen a lot of violence, war, deaths, and not only Guatemala, I think a lot of Central America has seen a lot of violence. And um, just doing a comparative uh, analysis here that in many parts of Africa, the end of violence, there is a certain rejection of institutions, church, government, even the people, the coup d'etats, those who want to overthrow the government, are also saying that they're on the side of the people. And so I am, my question is, uh, do you think that in terms of uh, the emergence of these Pentecostal groups, that this was maybe some kind of response to an anti-hegemonic uh, and institutional uh, movement against the church that uh, sometimes have been complicit in bringing about uh, the kinds of uh, things that led to the war? Whether going back to colonialism and imperialism, uh, do you think that um, and then that this is leading to something that can help as well as heal uh, institutional religion, especially the big ones like the Catholic Church? Thank you very much. Uh, very important uh, because um, we we have analyzed. Uh, last year, we had a symposium in Guatemala on fundamentalism and Pentecostalism, but having Pentecostal leaders in, and bishops and nuns, priests, lay people, uh, young, uh, in, the, in the three days a uh, congress we had, and uh, Analyzing the situation, is uh, we discovered that there are a lot of things that we have forgotten in the in our institution. For instance, uh, many women now they 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 are feeling that the discourse about uh, liberation of women and the protagonist and how to develop their leadership uh, in religious term, they are feeling that in a Pentecostal church, there are many, now uh, one topic we are uh, 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 researching is about the role of women, what women are uh, contributing in the fundamentalism now to renew the, the, the that movement, but also they are feeling that there is a space for their develop their leader uh, leadership, and uh, there are now the phenomena is a lot of uh, pastor women in front of the church, and if they are in front of the church and in front of the house and in the social uh, work also. So that is, uh, I would like to say that uh, Pentecostalism is the cry of the poor, the religious poor. They are asking for something, the sense of community. Because uh, our Catholic Church, but we can say the same with the uh, historical Protestant churches, that uh, we are massive we, in, in when we are the church is full of people but you don't 
you don't meet each other, you are far, you don't know who is in the church, but in the other one, and they mention your name, you say, come here, even if your first day that you are arriving to a Pentecostal church, they feel that you are the center of the, you know, and there are a lot of details that uh, Pentecostalism can teach us. Uh, I think it's, uh, they are, it's a denounce of many things that we have lost in a very bureaucratic church. And uh, also another uh, matter is the participation. I think it's a model of more uh, circular uh, a church and very simple. And uh, they are feeling free, no, no, to be tight. Uh, there are now uh, some, some people say, well, it is a fragmentation. Because they, today there is one church here, to many, 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 in, in Guatemala. It is said that when you see a garage, garage where you keep the, the car, every garage has vocation of Pentecostal church. <laughs> because people are renting them. You have a car. By the car you are using because you are working or you are traveling. And when you need the garage at night, so during the day you can rent your garage to somebody who wants to fund a little church without permission. So I think there is a cry, a cry for a community, more a community, affectivity, nearness, a, the kind of things, and a more this complicated religious practice also. And a, the, the sense of, of feast. Our countries, our cultures has a profound sense of feast. But sometimes Catholic Church uh, I'm criticizing ourselves uh, because it's much better to talk of your house, not uh, from the other uh, confessions. <laughs> but sometimes they're very boring, uh, very boring uh, uh, liturgy, or just uh, sometimes the priest, even in, in our country, sometimes priests are not preparing very well the sermon. And they took the microphone, and they don't, uh, they don't know how to finish, like me now. <laughs> they don't know how to finish, instead of giving the microphone to a lady, some lay people who can do the reflection, the sermon. Other questions, sir? I did have one. Sorry. 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 Thank you so much for, for, for your words. Um, so I'm actually, um, my family's from Puerto Rico, um, and one thing I've noticed is after the hurricane, for example, um, the recent hurricane, I noticed kind of the people talking about, in the radio at least, about being the island, uh, Isla del Cordero. And that's kind of, in our coat of arms, we have a lamb on top of a, a Bible, and kind of this identity of the people being the spiritual Israel. Um, physically being the island of the land. Um, I don't know if there's anything, it, it, did you, do you find that in, in Guatemala or any other of the Latin American countries where that specific country um, it, it feels like or, or identifies themselves with the, physically the spiritual Israel? And if so, um, for example, what I heard in the radio, for example, in Puerto Rico is, what have we been doing wrong? Um, and so, you know, after the hurricane, kind of this reflection of, like Israel, have we been engaging in idolatry, or what should we return to the sacred, or things of that nature, um, that maybe the Pentecostal church may offer, such as um, the gifts that Paul talked about, like glossolia, or uh, speaking prophesizing, and, and the gifts of healing, um, like you mentioned um, before. Yes, yes, uh, it is uh, the, that's uh, now even uh, 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 politicians that belongs to even the, 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 the current government that is in the, uh, belongs to a new Pentecostal church and uh, 
his uh, also in that discourse of the uh, uh, how it is in uh, Israel. Oh, uh, uh, Israel Cordel or, or? I don't know if it's like Cordel, but they use another terminology there, but it's the same it's idea, same idea, the same idea, and uh, it, the, in, emphasizing that is the, the the Israel, Israel, even even that the, the, there is some uh, very strange <coughs> thing that uh, with that uh, connection, like a um, uh, mythical return to Israel, and even uh, there is that promotion that we have to go to the, the real Israel, and there is the promotion of you have to you have to travel. You have to travel, but if you cannot, but you can support your pastor, and your pastor can travel to Israel in the name of you, uh, that kind of things. And even in Guatemala, it is a shame, but the uh, government decided uh, to to follow uh, even he said that a God, Godfather is Donald Trump, and he uh, he says he decided to reopen the embassy of Guatemala in Israel and to move to Jerusalem. Uh, and he's justifying every uh, political uh, and diplomatic decision with the, uh, his hand on the Bible and looking for texts from the Psalms, from the um, Pentateuch, from Thank you all very much. Thank you, sister. You return to Guatemala tomorrow. Yes, a uh, busy woman. Uh, I am leaving tomorrow. Uh, sadly, I didn't know that Chicago was so interesting. I should be here more time, but next time. <laughs> when you but come back, I'm leaving tomorrow. When you come back, we promise warmer weather. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.